is spirituality. As a sp- if you're prejudiced, just say you're prejudiced. If you're a sexist, say you're sexist. If you are racist, say you're a racist. If you're homophobic, say you're homophobic. Stop using your spirituality. Jesus is in trouble. High five, somebody say he in trouble. <laughs> Look on the other side and say, that's why I'm in trouble too. <laughs> He's in trouble because he won't conform to their expectations. He refuses to conform to their agenda. He shifts the power paradigm. He rejected oppressive structures. He advocated for a kingdom where the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And they send Jesus to Pilate to do what they don't have the backbone, Roger, to do on their own. Touch your neighbor and say, if you want to do dirt, you might as well have some backbone. Touch your neighbor and say, come on out the closet. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Stop looking for the Sanhedrin to do your dirty work. Stop looking for some religious leaders. Stop giving it to a lackey and an armor bearer. If you want to do your dirty, come on out the closet. In his book, Shaping the Claim, Dr. Marvin McMickle asserts that instead of using biblical characters as models of how we should live, we should use them as mirrors of how we actually do live. The truth of the matter is we don't want to be like Pilate, but we really are. The truth of the matter is we want to stand up for justice, but we get scared. The truth of the matter is is that we want to let Jesus go free, but we are worried about political expediency. We're worried about being put out. We're worried about being talked about. We're worried about being ostracized. Pilate reminds us that ergo midday, we are called to answer the question. What will you do with Jesus? Because there are lots of folk who claim to follow Jesus, but their ideals and their ideology and their practices and their conduct and behavior are antithetical to the Jesus who was tried before Pilate. The Jesus who stood before Pilate spoke spoke truth to power. The Jesus who stood before Pilate confronted religious leaders and Roman leaders. The Jesus who stood before Pilate was not silent in the face of oppression. you stop using spirituality as a sp- if you're prejudiced. Just say- All right, folks, Dr. Gina Stewart, the lead pastor at Christ Missionary Baptist Church out of Memphis, became the first woman to preach at the National Baptist Convention Joint Board Session last month. Folks were commenting on social media. Uh, a lot of people said they were pleased to see that. They were posting clips. Then all of a sudden, for some reason, the recording of her sermon, it was streamed, mysteriously disappeared from the National Baptist Convention's Facebook page. Now, they claim that it got hacked. But the problem is nobody else's sermon was deleted. Now, the sermon, we found it on the church's YouTube page. Um, Dr. Gina Stewart joins us right now from Memphis. Glad to have you uh, on the show, uh, my wife, Reverend Dr. Jackie Hood Martins, uh, had sent me a text about you preaching. Uh, and then when uh, I saw all the brouhaha, I said, you might want to go back and see what, see what happened. And she actually said <laughs> there were some photos that were posted. Uh, she had sent me because apparently um, it, was a, it was a Facebook, somebody posted on Facebook, Facebook that uh, some of the ministers walked out when you came to the podium. Did you see that happen? Uh, first of all, let me let me thank you, uh, Roland, for this invitation and for the opportunity to share. No, I did not see it. Um, I heard that there were persons who walked out during my preachment and also prior to me getting up to preach, but I did not see it myself. So um, now I also understand that the sermon is back on the Facebook page. But I was also told that at the end of your sermon, you preached about the need for the church to respect uh, black female preachers. But apparently that's missing? It's my understanding that the sermon has been edited. Uh, I've been traveling since I preached there last week, and so I have not had a chance to go and view it myself. But... If you're talking about the basically the part after the celebration where I was really in trying to encourage the persons who were in attendance to practice what Dr. Katie Cannon calls emancipatory practice, 
which is after we hear a, a, a sermon, we should look for ways to trace out liberating strategies to live out that word, live out that word. And so I was naming some of the things for trying to provide some concrete examples of how we can not only support women, but how we can be on the side of justice. Um, particularly as people of faith. Why do you, what's, now look, <laughs> you have some folks who are so old school, they believe that the Bible said that women cannot and should not preach. Uh, I always get a kick out of that uh, because if anybody actually reads the Bible, uh, uh, when, when, when Jesus came back, all the dudes had left. <laughs> They, uh, left, they left uh, before Jesus came back. <laughs> uh, 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 all the guys left. So when Jesus came back, he was like, <laughs> where the brothers at? And it was only women there. And it was the women who then went and told everybody, hey, uh, brother man came back. And told the story. Right. Yeah. So Jesus, first of all, Jesus models and egalitarian ministry. Jesus was a friend to women. Jesus affirmed women. Jesus stood up for women. Jesus empowered women. Women supported the ministry of Jesus. And so when we look at Jesus as a model, we see that Jesus' ministry was egalitarian. And in all of Jesus' interactions with women, <clears throat> Jesus was always looking for a way to not only neutralize the power of sin, but also to relieve those persons, not just women, but all people from oppression. Now, when you talk about scripture and what the Bible says, what I've discovered is that if people are looking for a reason to justify a position, which is part of what I was leaning toward or trying to allude to in my sermon, that we could find a verse, uh, even if we do it in term, use eisegesis to justify our position or our subjugation or our oppression of other people. <clears throat> but when we read the biblical witness, we find in the Old Testament, as well as in the New Testament, that women have always been used by God and that Jesus was certainly a friend to women, an advocate. How long have you uh, been preaching? Um, legally, <laughs> since 1989, but I actually started speaking in churches when I was about 18 years old. So that would be close to 40 plus years. Uh, I take it that you have had to endure uh, a whole lot uh, from some of the uh, rabbit fellas uh, when it comes to being a woman of the cloth standing in a pulpit. And, and again, let's be real clear. A lot of these people, they, ain't gotten, they don't have a problem with women serving in church. Right. So they ain't got a problem with women counting the money, uh, being the usher in the choir. So all these other, but, but oh no, you can't stay in the pulpit. So I'm sure you've had, you, you, you've got some quite interesting stories. Oh yeah, yeah. M myself along with, you could talk to any woman in ministry and you would find that all of us have interesting stories because, and, and, and of course in, in my tradition, uh, which is Baptist, Baptists have historically been, um, if you will, conservative as it relates to whether or not women can preach. There are even people that make the delineation that say, well, a woman can preach, but she can't pastor. And I've been pastoring close to 29 years, and you would not even begin to imagine some of the things that people have said uh, to members of my church over the years, male and female, when I was initially uh, called to pastor. People said they would, people would tell my members that they would go to hell because the, the pastor was a woman. Uh, I've had people to join our church excited about being a part of the ministry, but because some authority figure in their life uh, misinterprets scripture or misapplies scripture and makes them feel that they are out of the will of God, they have left the church because of that. So when you talk about the stories that could be told, uh, yes, I have stories, but there are hundreds of other women who are trying to fulfill, basically trying to fulfill the call of God on their lives that have encountered resistance, uh, subjugation, marginalization, invisibility. And 
what we saw, an, an example of what we saw with what happened to my sermon, uh, and although I don't really know what happened, but when it was deleted, it was a form of erasure, erasing uh, a woman's voice. As my uh, homiletics professor, Dr. Courtney Buggs, and I were talking yesterday, this is erasure, because if it's not there, it does not exist. And so, yes, to answer your question, yeah, we, we have plenty of stories to tell. We, we don't even have enough time to talk about the stories uh, and the incidents that we've experienced. I mean, I've I've been invited to um, do words of comfort. And this has happened as a pastor. I've been invited, and it has happened a while ago, but I've been invited to do words of comfort as a pastor for members of my church who invited me to come and have words of comfort. And there have been pastors, not, not many, but a few who have called me in advance and said, uh, I haven't taught my people yet about women in ministry. So I just want to ask you when you come, if you sit in the audience and not come to the pulpit. That happened to me as a pastor. I, I remember, I remember um, I, when I joined the Church Without Walls, uh, we were visiting uh, another church uh, and we were leaving church uh, and Jackie says, oh, uh, I got to stop by my place. I got to change clothes. I was like, what you got to change clothes for? Uh, well, uh, this church doesn't allow pants. And I was like, I guess we ain't going to visit that church. <laughs> I said, we have to give Pastor West uh, our, uh, uh, our... And so then, she, so then she started telling me about a, something that happened at this church where... Um, they all came in, and again, Pastor Ralph D. West, he was, he was senior pastor at Brook Hollow Baptist Church, Church Without Walls. But at this particular church, uh, one of the deacons, one of the homeboy just decided to go off. He was like, she can't sit on the front row. And then she, I can and then, that. and then she, and then, so then the other pastors from Church Without Walls says, uh, brother, this is Reverend Jackie Hood. She's the education minister, and she tells me that he, that he puts his hand in her face and he's looking <laughs> over here and says, I don't care who she is, she can't sit on the front row. And so then the other sisters in the church uh, made room for her to sit on the second row, and I said, let me be real clear. If that ever happens and I'm there, you might as well go get some bail money. I said, because a deacon going to get his ass whooped. Oh That's exactly God. what I said. I this said, I, oh, I don't play. I said, I'm telling you right now. I said, go get some bail money, because a deacon is going to get beat down at the front of the church if he put his hand in your face in my presence. I'm just letting you know how this going to go down. So what happened? Well. Did she leave? Oh no! But no, she sat sat the second row because past again. This, this is before we got together. This is before we got right. together. that. Okay. Oh, oh no, no. Let's be, no. <laughs> the story would not have ended that way uh, <laughs> if I was actually there at the church. Mm -hmm. But it's it's that kind of insanity uh, yeah. that 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 to me is just is just beyond stupid. And and even in this case here. Uh, and I'm having my staff check right now in the control room because I want to know if the end got cut. And if so, that to me is grossly offensive uh, that they would do that. And what's even more offensive to me is the hiding behind. If you going to cut it, <laughs> be a man and come out and say it. <laughs> right. But don't sit here, uh, uh, oh, we got, so you got hacked. Now, everybody else video up, but that one video came down. Come on now. See, and, 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 and that's the other deal for me. If you're going to be big and bad enough to do something, own it, but don't try to hide behind the pulpit when you get called out publicly. Yeah, and, and one, of, one of the things that I've been saying um, is, is I, I think that what I hope this moment will do is create these kinds of teachable moments that we're having where people are really having the discussion and really just talking about what it means uh, 
to to experience injustice, whether you are a woman, whether you are same gender loving, whether you are uh, people of color, oppression is oppression and oppression is real. Uh, it just so happened in this particular instance that what happened happened to me as a female or a woman. But I'm hoping that this will lead to a larger conversation about why the symptoms of what we saw with the removal of a video exist. Because what we're talking about are symptoms. Uh, what we really need to address is the system. The systems that continually contribute to the oppression, uh, the marginalization, the invisibility of women and other oppressed groups. And one of those things, one of those systems is patriarchy. One of those systems is sexism. One of those systems is misogyny. The, these are the larger issues that we often don't really want to talk about because when we bring those up, much as when we bring up racism, people think that we are complaining, that we're fussing, that you have a complex and all those kinds of things. And yet these are the systems that are deeply embedded in our, in society, in culture, and in our churches. And the tragedy is that uh, they go on without impunity. Uh, as you said, that, that deacon pointed his finger in your wife's face unapologetically. Uh, thankfully, Dr. Ralph West and his staff stood up for her, but in a lot of instances, that does not happen for women. Um, I, uh, because, so, all, so all is when that. Have you heard from Dr. Jerry Young, the yes. president of the, and so... What did he yes. say to you? He he apologized and he informed me that he would never do something like that. That uh, the same thing he said publicly in the convention is what he said to me, that they believed that it was hacked. And he said that he had friends with the FBI, that he had considered contacting, but someone advised him that he didn't need to contact the FBI. I'm sorry. He, um, if... <laughs> Hold up. See, right, right, Let right. Me roll it. Hold See, hold up, hold up. Right. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, he, would, he would, and someone advised him to contact the FBI. I mean, to contact uh, Facebook. And what I said to Doctor Doctor Young is similar to what I'm I'm still advocating, and, and that is, I said to him, I appreciated his phone call and I thanked him for his apology. But I and, and he was saying, I would never do that. And I said, but you must realize that because of the appearance of what occurred, perception is reality. And that it did not appear to be a coincidence, but it appeared to be a targeted incident where the only female who preached um, my sermon was removed. I also said to him that I believe this could be a pivotal moment for the convention because there are many women who serve in, in that particular convention. And that, that question, the woman question, still needs to be addressed. And what I try to encourage him to do and, and my comments to him in terms of his apology with that was that this is a pivotal moment. This could be a teaching moment. This could be a moment of liberation for the convention, a moment of liberation for uh, the women that serve and serve diligently, who give their money, who serve, and, and, and not just for the National Baptist Convention, because we know uh, that the needle still has has not moved very much. Many There are many more women that serve. Several women have been elected to serve in pastoral leadership, and women are begin people are beginning to consider women, but the numbers, there's still a great disparity. And so mm -hmm. what I what I said to him was this is this could be a very pivotal moment. If we really want to talk about this, let's talk about this in ways that we can address why this can, needs to stop happening and not why it happened, but why it needs to stop happening. Well, and what we've seen, we've seen in the Southern Baptist Convention how they are pulling back, uh, how they are uh literally um telling women don't you dare call yourself reverend. Uh, in fact, uh, that's what happened uh, to uh, Reverend Jackie. She was one of the top teachers at Lifeway. Uh, okay. And they literally told her, you have to, re you take, take Reverend off of your website. Do not refer to <laughs> Reverend and, or we are going to uh, stop allowing you to be a Lifeway instructor. 
Yeah. And I remember Fred, Reverend uh, Fred Luter, who later became head of the Southern Baptist right. Convention. President. Uh, he yeah. said to me that, he said, oh, whenever she was teaching her class, he said, we all flocked to her class. Right. Uh, he said, I remember being in the class, uh, but that's what the Southern Baptist Convention did. Uh, and, yeah, and the only, cr only thing I can give them credit for is being honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, 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 they were upfront about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that has caused a, a serious problem because you've got uh, a, a, number of, uh, a number of women who they made it perfectly clear. Uh, we don't, we, we don't, you're not going to call yourself a reverend. You're not going to call right. yourself a pastor. Uh, and, and that's been, you know, again, they want to return it to being a very conservative uh, uh, convention. And the reality is that it's causing friction. Numbers are dropping. Uh, the fastest growing part of the Christian church today is non-denominational. Folk right. not wanting to align with these denominations and all of their archaic rules. And, and, and to, to piggyback on what you said, the other fastest growing population is the nuns, the non-affiliated people who are not affiliated with any kind of church or denomination. Uh, because people see the hypocrisy uh, and I think I don't think people expect us to be perfect. People expect the church to be perfect, but they do expect us to be honest, expect us to be authentic, expect us to be realistic, even as we are struggling to um, think about how we want to practice Christianity and how we want to live out our lives as Christians, particularly those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus of Nazareth. Some of y'all in the YouTube chat got me laughing. Y'all sitting here saying, Roland, I can't believe you sat there and cussed uh, with the preacher on the show. First of all, in the words of Reverend Dr. William Barber, ass is in the Bible. <laughs> y'all know I ain't got no sense. So look, uh, I ain't the one with uh, papers. Look, uh, uh, Matt, Matt, <laughs> Matt, like, I know he ain't just do that. I did. Uh, but I know Homer would have got beat down just letting y'all know right now. Put your hand in my... Oh, it would have been on in that church. It would have been some Holy Ghost dancing going on. I've been tap dancing on his head. All right, y'all. Let's go with our questions. Uh, let's see here. Who shall go first? Uh, let me see who likely go to church. Probably not Michael. We know Matt a heathen. So, Kelly, you first. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, that, that threw me for a loop. Um, Reverend, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Um, my thank question you. to you is um, a little personal because um, I actually haven't been to church in a while. I, I, correction, I haven't had a church home in a while specifically because of church politics. Um, I grew up in a mega church. I saw how they treated my mom and family upon, you know, divorces and other, you know, interfamily things and uh, the hypocrisy that you mentioned. I've definitely mm -hmm. been witness to quite a few things. So mm -hmm. it left a bad taste in my mouth. Not saying I'm any less Christian, but I'm really um, discerning when it comes to a church home. Um, mm -hmm. So my question to you is regarding women in the pulpit in general. Um, because that's another thing. My mom was a minister of music. I've seen her on the pulpit many times, um, both as a music director and a musician, but also as a preacher. How do you encourage and help other women reconcile the church politics and, frankly, what you had to deal with just last week uh, by way of what we've been talking about? How do you reconcile the church politics and and the gunk so to speak, with with the pure faith that you have and the call that God has on many women's hearts to come mm -hmm. to a pulpit? Mm -hmm. That That's a long question and a good question. And, and I'll, I'll try to give you my cliff note version. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord. Yes, the cliff note version. <laughs> my cliff note Kelly version. with the eight-part question. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think first of all, you do have to recognize, number one, and, and I'll, I'll kind of share out of my own experience. When I was making the decision to go into ministry, uh, I was aware of some of the resistance that I would encounter, not necessarily from my uh, pastor because he was very affirming of women, but because I knew that our denomination 
was was conservative toward women. And I knew that there were people who would not necessarily embrace my calling. But what I had to do was spend a, some time, a season of discernment, uh, spend some time in a season of prayer to get this green light, if you will, from God. And, even, and, and of course, after even talking with some of my, one of my mentors, one of the things she told me was no one can uh, clarify your calling. No one can validate your calling. That's something that God has to do. But she did tell me, act on what you have been told to do. And what I decided to do was act on that, yes. And I accepted my call to ministry uh, at the age of 29. And here I am at the age of 63. And while there have been challenges, I would, I would, I'm glad that I said yes. Uh, as it relates to the politics, I think we have to realize that churches are spiritual organisms, but they're also made up of human people. That, and those people work with us on their jobs. They work, work with us on our jobs. They're in our sororities. They're in our fraternities. And we have to recognize that people are not where it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we are all on a trajectory of growth. And people mature at varying stages and at varying places. I don't know that you can get around politics because wherever you have uh, a, a group of people uh, politics is going to shape, in some way, shape that organization. I think that what we have to be as leaders, and what I've tried to be as a leader, is a leader of integrity, a leader of transparency, a leader who tries to be objective in my dealings with people, and be fair to everybody, and try to make sure that our systems are integrous, and that there's accountability and that we're answerable to someone, including the pastor is answerable to someone so that we do not create those kinds of experiences that cause people to say, well, you know what? Uh, when I was growing up, they used to say, baby, just stay out the office. If you stay out of the office and what they were really referring to, if you can, if you can stay away from the politics of church, that you would be fine, but you really cannot be involved without experiencing some of that. And um, so I think one of the things we have to do is realize that we're dealing with human beings who have shortcomings, not to make excuses, but we also have to realize that people... Yeah, just fact. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't care. I mean, the, 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 look, listen, the church, the club, the, 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 the Fortune 500 company, uh, right. I mean, you can sit here and, and, and bring up any organization where regular, ordinary folk are there, you're going to find drama, you are gonna find all of that, uh, and trauma. I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah, drama, trauma. You are gonna have all of that sort of stuff. And for all, and, and for the simple Simons out there uh, who are sitting here, uh, and that's the black church. Uh, no, it's the, not. The biggest. It's, 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 the, first, it's not unique to the listen, black church. listen. The Southern Baptist Convention. The report was done showing all of the freaks and the pedophiles and the sexual abusers in there. And let's not talk about. Uh, the Catholic Church uh, right. and and all of the nonsense there. So let's just be real clear right there. All right. And, I, and, and can I add? Can I add, Roland? That I think the other thing has to do with expectations. Mm -hmm. And and whenever there is a discrepancy between expectation and reality, disappointment occurs. When, when we go into a church, we have this expectation that it will be different. That it will just be joy to work with the saints and that everybody loves Jesus and everybody uh, is, is going to be uh, above board, that people are not malicious, that you won't encounter any of the things we encounter on our job, but that is not the reality. The reality is, is that the same people that we work with on our jobs in these other spaces are also in our churches. Indeed. Uh, Matt? First, I want to say, uh, Dr. Stewart, you notice that Roland talking about me, but he talking about fighting Deacon Aloysius Jenkins in the church. So hey, put, put, your, put, your hand, Roland, put your hand in saying, my wife's face. Just, I'm letting well, you know what's going to go down. You make it. Well, you know what? In any we, event. We, <clears throat> But, well, we're, we're oh, yeah. grateful that you are willing to defend your spouse. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm listen. Do it to my wife, my sister, my mama. I'm just letting y'all know somebody gonna get smacked. Just letting y'all know. I'm hey, you said be upfront and honest. I'm being upfront and honest. <laughs>
I've been in federal court all day. Let me just say not guilty, Roland. Just don't make any admissions. <laughs> in any event, uh, Dr. Stewart, um, thank you for joining us and thank you for your leadership. My thank father you. is actually a Baptist pastor in Austin, and he's had women preach in his church. But one of the things he and I talk about often when he talks about his church is the, the issues with membership. I mean, the average age of people in his church are, you know, elderly and he doesn't have a lot of young people come into the church, even in a big city like Austin. So my question to you is, what are you finding as a corollary with women being put in prominent uh, positions in the church, like yourself, pastoring a church? Are you finding a correlation between how many young and new people you're able to bring into the fold and keep them there if women are prominently in leadership? I, I think it depends on, on the context. Um, I'm in the South, and um, I had one person <clears throat> to tell me uh, who had moved their membership that they moved their membership because uh, they wanted to see more men in leadership. And what I said to them was, I don't think you want to see more leadership. You wanted to see, you probably wanted to see, your husband probably wanted to see all men in leadership. Mm. But because but because I believe in an inclusive kind of church, the body of Christ, that male and female bring gifts, children, seniors, young adults, et cetera, then inclusivity should be um, what is, I try to practice inclusivity. And so um, as it relates to the way that I lead, women and men lead at our church. Uh, and we're trying to train children to grow up to lead. We give them space to lead. We try to create space because that's the kind of environment that I was raised in. I didn't, as in, in my church environment, uh, I did not become an adult and start serving in churches and giving, be, being, get, and, and given opportunities to lead. I was given those opportunities to lead and to nurture my gifts from the age of 10 when I was baptized up until I began to accept my call to ministry and then later went into the pastorate. So I think a lot of it has to do with the, I'm saying that to say, I think a lot of it has to do with the philosophy of the pastor and that pastor's ministry philosophy. I operate from a philosophy of inclusion, which means that I'm always trying to be intentional about making sure that everybody in the congregation is represented. Because when people come to a congregation, they need to see themselves. If a woman goes into a congregation and she doesn't see anything but men in leadership, that should be a red flag. Before the pastor says anything, it should be a red flag that this may not be a place where my gifts can flourish. Because what we, who we put in leadership says a lot about what we think about the people that we are inviting to serve. Our values. That's right. Thank you, Doc. Michael. You're welcome. All right, Dr. Gina Stewart. I guess Roland said he was saving the heathen for last. But even <laughs> though I don't go to a, even sustained, to, sustained. <laughs> <laughs> even though I don't go to a church physically, I do attend um, uh, services online. Uh huh. Bedside Baptist Village, the, the African Village out of uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And you were doing that before COVID. Service. Yeah, before COVID. Yeah, yep, Bedside Baptist. Going back to 2010. Going back to 2010. <laughs> What'd you say? Roland won't let you state the case. Gone. Yeah, well, he's, he, Gone. That's, he always does that. Come on, uh, Bedside uh, Baptist. Churches. Come on, Bedside Baptist. So in your January 23rd speech, you said, I think the larger issue is how has patriarchy, how has misogyny, misogynoir, and sexism uh, to the symptoms and the kinds of practices that we see. And then right before the break, you said that this can serve as a moment of liberation. And you talked about women being oppressed in the church. What was the response from pastors, from ministers, male pastors, ministers, et cetera, when you talked about this can serve as a moment of liberation and women being oppressed in the church? What was their response to those statements? Well, I didn't make that statement directly in my sermon. Mm -hmm. I was saying that I would hope that this, the way that the sermon has gone viral, that this could be a moment, this could be a watershed moment, a turning point for the church to examine some of its practices and, 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 and even in other spaces that we examine our practices in terms of the way that we treat not only women, but other uh, oppressed and marginalized lives groups. Now, I will say that one of the things that, in addition to the way that this sermon has gone viral and just been on all kinds of platforms, 
has been the way that this message has resonated with male and female, with men and women. Uh, there were as many men um, complaining about the sermon being taken down as there were women. And okay. I, I found that to be all inspiring and humbling uh, at the same time, because typically you find that women will, will come uh, to the defense of women. But in mm -hmm. this particular case, it, it appeared to me as I, and, and as I have received text messages and messages of encouragement from people on social media, uh, in my direct, uh, folks are DMing me on Facebook. It has been men and women who have been uh, affirming this message. And, and I'm hoping that that will continue, you know, that this, this, this will not just be a one-time moment, but this will be a movement that we will really begin right. to try to be like Claudia because at the end of the day, what I was really, the, the, the question of the sermon was, what will you do with Jesus of Nazareth? And the question pointed to the fact that the Jesus that we preach about was a Jesus who was on the side of the oppressed, a Jesus who spoke truth to power, a Jesus who did not tolerate corruption, a Jesus who challenged people, a Jesus who was a friend to women. What will we do with that Jesus? Well, there was a woman who spoke up for him. And I believe that that is a part of our charge, that as we represent Jesus, we speak up for Jesus in those spaces where we see those kinds of practices taking place. We're talking about not just what we do on a Sunday morning, but what do we do or when a sermon is proclaimed, but what happens after the benediction is given after we have shouted, after we have danced, after we have spoken in tongues or whatever and rejoiced and, and celebrated all of the rhetorical artistry and the homiletical genius that we love so much in black preaching. At the end of the day, how will we live our lives? What will be our way of being in the world as people who follow Jesus of Nazareth? And how will we practice our Christianity? Right. What has Pardon, been a blessing has been the response mm -hmm. of male and female, and even young people and children. Right. All right, then. Well, uh, Reverend Stewart, I appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Um, so are you a deacon, Roland? No, nah, I'm bootleg. <laughs> you what? <laughs> Not bootleg. I'm bootleg. I'm bootleg. I'm oh, bootleg. Okay. I mean, bootlegging, I've done. I, I've, bootlegging I've, I've, preaching I, or bootlegging deaconing? No, no, I'm, I'm bootlegging preaching. I, I've, I've, <laughs> I've done a number of churches. In fact, probably like seven straight years, I did uh, Pat Reverend Kenneth Whalem's uh, Men's Month, uh, oh, yeah. and so I know yeah. So I have. Uh, I've, I've been his pulpit, uh, Reverend Jenkins uh, at, at uh, First Baptist Glen Arden churches in Chicago. So if I invite, if I invite you to Memphis, you'll come. Oh, I'll come, but you got my wife first. She got papers. Okay, I can do that. She got papers. Okay, she she did all that seminary stuff. She got papers. I ain't you know, doing. I ain't got time for all that. <laughs> you know, one of the things one of the things that's important to me is you talk about inviting women, and I know my time is up, but is yo, yo, no, your time not up? I, I own the show. Oh, okay. Is the stewardship of my ministry. And, and one of the things that's important to me is opening doors for other women. So, um, and that's another example. You know, a lot of times you'll see a flyer and you'll see one woman and you'll see three men. Mm -hmm. but, but on my flyer, you might see three women and one man. There you go. Uh, because I believe that stewardship of this influence and this great gift that I've been given is not only a responsibility I have, but it's something that I'm accountable to God for. So, yeah, I would probably invite your wife first. That's fine. <laughs> right. I, ain't, I ain't got a problem with that. I ain't got a problem with that. I'm good. I, I tell you what, you know, because, see, normally when she, when she get ready for a sermon, she go, like, into a cocoon and be sitting there, That's like, fine. be she going book, to sit with the Lord. Be, like, books all around. I'm like, man, what you doing? So I, I'm getting prepared for my sermon. I say, when's your sermon? She's like, in three weeks. I'm like, three weeks? I'm like, what you doing? <laughs> So she's taking her assignment serious. She got like, man, that's just so she got she got Long live Reverend Jack. She got mad at me because so I, I I did a church, I did three, I did three services in Chicago. So we in the car. She's like, what you gonna talk about? I'm like, I ain't decided. I'm like, I ain't decided. <laughs> so I'm I'm sick of I don't write speeches. So we sit, we sit in the pope, the pope, and they are introduced me and the choir singing. And so I just I grab my Bible, open it up, I see a scripture, cut that sucker in half come up with the title, and I knocked it out in about 40 minutes. And she was like, 
She said, I can't stand when you do that. I said, baby, <laughs> I, I said, baby don't hate the gift. <laughs> so you you both have different sermon methodologies. I said, don't hate, I said, don't hate the gift. <laughs> don't, don't hate the gift. <laughs> what you shaking your head for, Matt? Don't hate the gift. <laughs> I can't hear you, Matt. He's muted. Matt, you're on mute. Y'all, y'all got Matt turned down? Listen, they said, Mike, you, look, they said you, what you say, Matt? Now, nah, Matt, you're on mute. I don't know what's going on. Well, bottom line is, listen, that's how I roll. Uh, and so, listen, God gives me to a whole different way. But that 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 cocoon stuff, I'm like, girl, that's way too much for me. Uh-uh. <laughs> I can't. I, uh-uh. No, that's too much for me. Listen, Roland, everybody's methodology is different. I know. I know. I, like, yeah. I, I, like, I, I just tell them, don't hate the gift. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> hey, I appreciate it. Got it. You got it like that, okay? All right, hey, 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 like he gave it to me. I'm gonna use it. All right, that's right. Tell I appreciate. It. All right, let me know when I'm coming to Memphis. All right. All right, I appreciate. It. Thanks a bunch.